OK. Thank you very much for people joining us here at the World Economic Forum in Davos and for people joining us online for this really important, wide-ranging panel on the end of development. A critical issue. Um, a critical issue because when I was kindly asked by colleagues here at Davos to chair this, so I should introduce myself, I'm Faisal Islam, I'm the BBC's economics editor. When I was asked, I thought it was one of those great questions that you can take two entirely different ways. Is it the end of development bad news because uh, in, the, in the sense that you know, we're um, processes that have led to the rising living standards around the world, shared prosperity <coughs> are going into reverse, or is it the end of development not so bad news because actually many developing countries are, um, uh, uh, are now way along the path than anybody might have even expected 20 or 30 years ago when these sorts of issues were being discussed at this forum and others. Um, and we're going to discuss a, a whole series of related issues around this sort of what has been called the kind of deglobalization theme, fatigue, of course, with globalization. I always think, coming from Britain, that globalisation itself is a word that has failed to globalise, because we spell it with an S, and here they spell it with a Z, but there we go, a Z, even, I should say. Um, the, the shocks geoeconomically that, of course, cast a shadow over this event, just at the point when people felt we were coming out of three years of rolling, kind of interacting shocks. Um, the, uh, another one or two uh, come along. Um, the role of industrial policy in advanced economies, the sort of refusal, if you like, from some of the Western economies newly to accept that globalization will just raise everybody's living standards um, and wanting to, and this is fascinating, isn't it? Who would have thought at this forum 20 years ago that the, the Western G7 nations mm. would be copying the policies of the emerging economies? But that's what we've got, it just shows that futurology uh, is rather difficult. Uh, rapid technological uh, risks as well, transforming the world economy, but also maybe changing some of the dynamics around economic convergence. So what practical solutions can continue the progress in rising living standards? Um, it, just in terms of some of the housekeeping, uh, we're going to be talking for about uh, 25 minutes up here. And we'll have questions uh, 15 minutes. I'm going to introduce the participants in a second. The online audience, or indeed people here, uh, can use the hashtag, hashtag WEF24. Uh, let me introduce this great panel. Uh, from close to me here, we have Anne Beta Tvinerheim, the Minister of International Development for Norway. We have Ibrahim Patel, the Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition of South Africa. We have Rebecca Greens uh, Grinspan, the Secretary General of the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, from Geneva. And Simon Freakley, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Alex Partners uh, from America, a really good insight he has uh, in terms of the... Um, uh, the private sector's views on all of this. Let's just have a show of hands on this issue um, from the audience here. Um, is the rapid rise of convergence in emerging economies living standards with the advanced economy, something we've taken for granted, is it now coming to an end? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes. Who thinks it is? That's an, well, I think that's a total consensus. Is that, there is no question there. Well, so let's, let's move on. Let's bring in... Let's bring in Rebecca first, OK? OK, you, you, you pump out a whole load of reports and statistics. And what is the evidence as regards um, some of these processes that we've taken for granted of globalisation and uh, emerging economies, rapid rise in living standards, of whether it's slowing in some way or, or changing its, its pattern and its nature? Well, what, what we see in the numbers, yes, in the, in the prospects and what we saw in 23, it's since the pandemic, let's say, is two different divergences. Uh, so we, we see within the developed countries also a divergence between the growth rates of the US and the growth rates of Europe. And in the developing countries, we see also a divergence between the growth rate of the, of the emerging big economies and the rest. So in a way, there is this, uh, we can say we have the rich, the big, and the rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the emerging economies, the big emerging economies are doing very well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, the prospects for this uh, year are also good. They will be 
uh, uh, growing much more than the developed countries. Mm. So there, there is a convergence, mm. yes? But the rest is not following the path of the big... I, I, I it's quite remarkable, really, given, you know, even last year at this event, when you think about what's happened in the global economy, run-up of debt to service through the crisis, the pandemic crisis, then, a, then almost the worst possible thing, interest rates whacked up immediately afterwards. Many people here were predicting <coughs> kind of rolling emerging market crises that haven't materialised. No, no. <laughs> They're just simply... the is, uh, they are not uh, growing at the same rate they were growing before the pandemic. Right. Let's be clear. Yes, we haven't recovered from the pandemic uh, in terms of uh, growth rates. And part of the, what worries us is that the slow growth uh, 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 indicator that we have is because we have very weak trade growth and very weak investment growth. And that's what affects the rest of the developing countries. Yes, if you don't have, uh, you know, the push the engine of trade, if you don't have the engine of investment, what are the growth prospects for the rest of the developing countries. But the big ones are doing well. Yeah. They are doing well in trade and they are doing well in, in investment. And they have their own resilience and, you know, a capacity precisely because of their size. Yeah. Okay. And then just, just unpack that, that slowdown in trade growth, just lastly. Is that, as far as you can see, part of a policy of rolling back freer trade maybe more regional trade, uh, a bit of scepticism about the benefits of totally free trade around the world. Yeah, especially in the north. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't think that the, the fatigue with globalization is so clear in the south. Yeah, yeah? interesting. Because they, they need trade and they need investment, yes? So what we see is nationalist policies or industrial policies going, you know, in the rich countries, yes, and they have the fiscal space to do that. They can use the subsidies. But the developing countries, the rest of the developing countries, yes, these small and medium-sized countries, don't have the fiscal space to do that and to run industrial policy in the same way. They will need other instruments. And that's where the multilateral system has to come in. You know, we need much more financing from the international system uh, to crowd in private investment into these countries. And we need also trade rules that will allow these countries to add value to their own raw materials and critical minerals so they can follow an industrial policy that will be sustainable, but also foster growth, a much faster growth. OK, that's a great vista. Thanks for that, Rebecca. Let's bring in Ibrahim Patel now on as, you know, uh, uh, in the, the, one of the most important economies in the world now, member of the G20, asserting itself on the world stage. Do you see a change in the weather in terms of how global trade works? Do, do you see this actually tangibly in some of the trade deals you're doing and the trade pattern South Africa enjoys? Well, Faisal, you made a, um, a, an interesting observation and, you, and, and you, you put it provocatively. Could one imagine developed countries copying the model of development of developing countries. And, and let me perhaps start with that observation. The path that China and the number of fast-growing um, Asian economies followed in turn copied a much earlier model of development in Europe and in the United States. And so historically, if you think about <clears throat> uh, trade, uh, countries built uh, I mean, the, the whole history of, of, of trade is replete with examples of developed countries having quite, um, quite high barriers as they build industrial capability, uh, as specialization, as the benefits of uh, competition became more evident, they were able to put, to reduce that trade. And in the, um, uh, the colorful language of one development economist, they then kicked away the ladder of development. Mm. Asian countries followed that. Within this new uh, uh, rules-based system, they found opportunity and advantage. And here's the issue for us. Um, we, we are living in a world that's more fractious, in a world that's more volatile. I think volatility is being baked into the system. Uh, the division that we're seeing, though, need not be. 
The argument for multilateralism is strong. Think about uh, global history, not only the period of the WTO, or even the period of, of GATT. If you think over the last uh, many hundreds of years, uh, human development has been enhanced by greater trades of, uh, a greater flow of trade, uh, more uh, uh, ideas flowing, people traveling, and so on. But at the same time, those rules need rebalancing. Those rules themselves need rebalancing. We need rules. We don't need the strongest to be able to assert uh, itself. Uh, but the rules need rebalancing. And so what I see now in the discussions we have with um, countries on the African continent, as well as uh, the discussions uh, among BRICS countries, is um, a real sense that um, many in the global south need a different set of rules. I'll give an example, uh, perhaps, of, of, of this. And um, uh, in a Bloomberg uh, moderated discussion this morning, I quoted some statistics. And just permit me, uh, Faisal, to, to briefly repeat them. If I think about it as an African, uh, Africa accounts for 17% of the world's population today. It only generates 3% of global GDP. And if you take as the metric of, uh, let's say, um, uh, s significant growth, growth that adds value across society, which is uh, industrialization, not just uh, 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 raw material uh, exports, then Africa accounts for perhaps in autos and in steel output, 1% or just under 1% of global output. So that needs to be changed. So coming back to your question then, there is certainly a sense on the African continent <coughs> that um, we need to become the defenders of a multilateral system, a rules-making system that works, but we need to question whether those rules have always been well-balanced. And that is what I think uh, in um, the ministerial conference at the end of February is going to be a big issue. Later, I hope, we'll have an opportunity to talk about this in the context of climate change. Yes, we definitely will get onto the issue of climate change. Just let me just unpack that, the, the idea that the South-South needs a different set of rules. That's quite interesting. Is that in the context of, say, the Americans kind of chucking tens of billions of pounds, at, well, not just green industry, but the, the, the chips industry? You know, you see that, you know, your country has a fantastic science base. It, it could be a home for some of these industries but now that the Americans are doing it and the Europeans are doing it, which is understandable in their own world, do you feel like some of these understandable decision, uh, decisions are kind of cutting off the global south from some paths of development? You've put it so beautifully that um, I, I want to illustrate it. Okay. And I illustrate it using um, uh, a green industrialization. This is the next big wave. It will happen. It has to happen. The world has to make the transition from coal-based high carbon emission to a greener future. But there's, a, there's, a, there's an enormous competition about who's going to dominate these technologies. On the one side, the United States is throwing enormous sums of money through the Inflation Reduction Act into building competitiveness and capability in that, something that we can't match. As um, was mentioned by um, uh, Rebecca, we don't have the fiscal space to do so. On the other end, the European Union is using, this is my view of it, and it's the view of, of, of many in the global south, uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism to um, uh, build an advantage for European firms. And so we sit with this challenge of how we navigate also getting into green industrialization when we can't match either the, um, the amounts of dollars thrown into it uh, on the one hand, or the closing of markets which is an important instrument of development, on the other hand. And this is what the discussion is about. OK, great. Let's bring in Alex, give a private sector perspective. You know, what are you hearing? Are the business people that you speak to and advise every day, do they feel that some of the rules of the road, the you know, inherent automatic kind of free market kind of basis for, for how things have been run is fundamentally changing and they're having to adapt to it? Thanks, Faisal. Well, obviously, I live in the world of business, and what I see is that we've all got so used over the last 30 years to this super cycle, and we've convinced ourselves it's usual. Lower barriers of trade, uh, global capital markets, global supply chains. 
Uh, and of course, the pandemic came and gave us an awful shock that actually things weren't as seamless as we got used to. And then, of course, multiple crises have followed. So one almost wonders whether, as a business person, one's going from a poly crisis to a perma crisis, because whether it's geopolitical events that continue to not just shock the world but comprehensively dis disrupt supply chains, whether it's the fact we have almost 80 elections in the world this year with 40% of the world's population voting, uh, a rise in nationalism which makes for instance, an American first philosophy uh, in the US, quite attractive from an electoral point of view. We come to the end of this super cycle of 30 years and the rules are changing and people are having to pivot and adjust. You know, Rebecca, you mentioned about the difference between Europe and America. It's interesting. If you look at the total population of Europe and the total population of, a, of the states, it's about the same, about 330 million people. If you look at the number of large companies in the global 500, it's about the same. So why is it that the US has grown? grown so much faster. Well, part of it's to do with a contiguous landmass of people speaking largely the same language. That actually is a, a one of the reasons, but also because some of the frictions uh, of trading around Europe were not there in the States. And so I think that, to your question, Faisal, I think that business leaders have found that the strategies that used to work no longer work. They have to remain very agile indeed. Uh, we do a survey every year, as you know, we've just published the most recent Alex Partners Disruption Survey, 3,000 interviews with business leaders around the world. Um, and I expected to see in that that uh, generative AI was their biggest concern. It actually came out as their number one uh, opportunity. They felt that this was an opportunity to drive growth in their businesses, but also to drive growth in our economies, because what's good for business growth is also good for economies in terms of lifting the living standards of so many. And so I think if I've got one takeaway, Faisal, from all the conversations I have with business leaders around the world, not just in America, is that there are so many things to focus on. The most stressful thing is deciding which ones to focus on. Uh, and ultimately, because so many of these things are out of their control, just deciding what, is, what are the things they can control to try and maximise their outcomes. OK, I mean, of the prime example here in terms of this process has been China's growth over the past 20, 30 years, which has obviously underpinned this globalisation story. Yes. You know, I, was, I was amazed over the past 12 months to see kind of Western leaders and executives kind of, they weren't feigning it because it was genuine. It's a surprise that suddenly China had the world's biggest electric vehicle right. industry and it was, you know, about to arrive in Europe and eat everybody's lunch. And it was almost like they hadn't noticed or, you know, how, did, how had they not noticed? You know, it was publicly kind of megaphoned out by the Chinese authorities 20 years ago. They started buying up the critical minerals, started buying, you know, all, the, all of that. You know, I, and I just wonder sometimes, despite coming to events like this, you know, there, there's a sort of certain lack of intellectual engagement with what is going on and what is transforming the world before our eyes. Of course, and so 40% of the global world's growth has come from China since 2010, and people have had this dislocated view as to that sort of macro stat and exactly what it means in terms of the practical example you've just given. What I was shocked about, I live in New York, I live in the US, uh, what I was shocked about actually in the last 18 months is how one of the few things that Democrats and Republicans could seem to agree on was a toxic narrative about the relationship between the West and China. And I thought it was rather alarming that actually that China was being demonized. People had got so used to China being the shop floor of the world, producing goods to discount, global supply chains meant that it was just in time rather than just in case delivery and then all of a sudden people are shocked about the economic significance and clout that China has. Mm -hmm. I'm very relieved to find that certainly led by business leaders, some of whom are here, have actually put a much more realistic narrative into the relationship between China and the West. But I think there is still some anxiety mm -hmm. about whether actually uh, China is the sleeping giant here and maybe that their economic power will actually affect a change in security power as well, which itself, of course, is another disruption that business leaders have to plan around and manage. Okay, well, let's look at another dimension of, of this um, in terms of development. And part of this piece of people looking more inwardly in the West has been a rollback in some nations in terms of development spending, maybe the development agenda. Uh, I don't know, what do you feel? I know Norway's doing more now. Put that in context in terms of what you see elsewhere in the West to, in terms of development and aid funding. 
Well, um, there are some mega trends that Rebecca mentioned that uh, really should worry us all because we have all signed up to leaving no one behind and we only have a few years left to, you know, delivering on, on, uh, on the sustainable development goals. But what we see right now is that the inequalities between countries and globally are increasing and the financial streams to the least developed countries is really, uh, they're lagging much further behind. Um, and we see that uh, donor strategies are, sh are, are changing. Um, more focus on security, migration, uh, climate, which is understandable, but it shouldn't come at the cost of getting finance and development uh, finance out to the least developed countries as well. We see that you know, one of the strategies that Norway and many other uh, countries are applying is to uh, leverage private capital. That's why I, am, as a Minister of International Development, I'm at Davos because I need to you know, dis discuss with private sector how can we take some of the risk of your investments, making sure that you are also interested in the slightly more complex markets. Mm. Um, and um, uh, we see, especially on climate finance, that we have a lot of success on getting uh, investments, you know, uh, uh, private investments into uh, emerging, the, the big emerging economies, like Rebecca said, but it's very, very difficult to get the appetite for private investments into uh, least developed countries, okay. uh, which is understandable, but, you know, um, uh, I think that the future, one of, one of the, the, the key issues for um, future development assistance is to take the risk of some of those investments. Uh, the, the problem, of course, if that if we are to, it would be a huge opportunity to get these countries um, that have millions of people lacking energy that need to get into, you know, where we need to create value chains to get those leapfrogging some of the fossil technology, for example, that we are stuck in, in our part of the world, imagine what it would do a benefit for uh, the battle for climate if we are to leapfrog these economies. But then we need to work together and get the financial flows running also in these countries. And right now it's really going in the wrong direction. And that's a, that's a huge concern. So are you finding that your strategies have changed and you're refocusing some of your investments on the, on the least developed countries as opposed to the emerging economies which aren't so troubled in accessing private capital? Well, we're doing both and we okay. find that it's a lot easier to get so to leverage pri private finance for the emerging economies. You now, the renewable sector in, you know, Vietnam and India and South Africa, it's, it's exploding. Um, uh, 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 and um, in the least developed countries, it's more traditional aids. But I think that's, that's not going to get us there. Yeah. And that's why we need to develop um, mechanisms, guarantee schemes, way to leverage private capital where we can take some, uh, some risk off private investments. And, and we, we, we are able to do it in some places. I recently visited uh, Baidoa in Somalia, you know, close to close to, you know, the, 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 where Al-Shabaab is, uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is, and um, we have been able to get private uh, companies invest in solar panels and solar, uh, uh, solar panel factory, or sorry, uh, what do you say, solar parks? Yes, uh, solar in, parks. Um, you know, in, in Somalia, uh, investing in renewable energy for refugee camps and hospitals uh, in very, very difficult circumstances, it is possible. What we need to have a more active dialogue with private companies on how can we work together. Uh, Mr. Minister Patel, and you may want to come in on this as well, there's been a big change, hasn't there, over the past 20, 30 years, which is the role of sovereign wealth funds in terms of their investments, their strategies that has changed the nature of how emerging economies and least developed countries are being supported? To some extent, um, <clears throat> I think that there's, there's scope to do a lot more. We, we, we've been working with uh, some of the sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East. And of course, Norway is um, one of the world's biggest uh, sovereign wealth funds. What we, what we find is that uh, on climate change, there's a growing appetite to do more. Mm. But very often the, uh, the terms of that 
doesn't sufficiently incentivize what, requ what is required domestically. I want to, to, to um, pivot uh, to the combination of investment and trade as really what we, we, we need to do. We're busy at the moment um, putting in place the final modalities for the rollout of what is really the most significant action on the trade front, which is the development of an African continental free trade yes. uh, area. Yeah. It will bring together eventually 54 countries, uh, of which 49 have already ratified the treaty, and we're busy now putting uh, the final bits into place. And what that will do is it, it opens up the opportunity for the emergence of strong regional value chains, bringing in least developed and developing economies. South Africa exports large numbers of vehicles to other parts of the world. We sell it here in Europe. If you see a Ford a light delivery vehicle, a Ranger vehicle, chances are it's made in South Africa. If you see a, a Mercedes-Benz C-Class vehicle, chances are it's made in South Africa. But what we do is the rubber that goes into the tire comes from Cote d'Ivoire and from um, uh, uh, Nigeria and um, uh, from um, Malawi. The uh, copper comes from Zambia. The um, seats that are made comes from Lesotho. The wire harnesses that holds the electronics together is manufactured in Botswana. And it's then all integrated in South Africa and exported to other parts of the world. So it's a model of development that relies on both trade and investment and finding that connection and deepening that connection. So our goal is that by getting lower trade barriers uh, between African countries, mm. we can facilitate more of those regional value chains. We, we are a continent that have exported historically uh, raw materials to the factories of the world. Yeah. We want to become the, the factory climate. of the world. Mm. And uh, there's a demographic argument we should raise, and that is the, the action on, on population growth is going to be largely in the next, uh, in the period between now and 2050 is projected to be an African action. Uh, we 1.4 billion people, uh, we're destined to be, uh, or it's projected to be 2.8 billion people, um, and uh, one out of every two uh, young babies born over the next uh, two decades will be born on the African continent. So it, it, it underlies the urgency of a development model that is not simply reliant on selling more raw materials, yes. yep. but that beneficiates and processes it on the African continent. But is, is your plan here, is the strategy to draw up a wall around that regional trade block? This has been maybe the pattern, Rebecca will be able to speak better to that, or do you want to connect a little bit like EFTA or something like that? Do you want to be able to connect this new African free trade bloc with the rest of the world? And do you say to the West, let, let, this, let this thrive? There's no question about it that our development can't be based only on us trading with each other. As we build capability and, and competitive strength, we need access to the American market. We have it at the moment through the Africa Growth and Opportunities Act. South Africa and four other neighboring countries have a free trade agreement with the European Union and with the United Kingdom. We need that too. But we need the policy space, Faisal, that uh, many others have used in the past on trade policy to be able to work out where is it appropriate based on the evidence and being very pragmatic. Where do you need to have some uh, protection? Where do you need to open up? And it's the mix of those that constitutes an effective development model. Just could, could I build on that yeah, point yeah, of course, for yeah. a moment, if I may? Um, ready for, uh, yeah. One of the consequences of the pandemic, which of course is now in the rearview mirror, is that uh, businesses around the world found that they couldn't rely on global supply chains. They couldn't rely on just-in-time supply chains. It, supply chains used to be things that were given to a head of procurement to worry about. It's now on board agendas because it brings businesses to a standstill. Mm -hmm. So the point you make about the interplay of regional supply chains, I think, is not just an issue in a development sense. It's an issue in a business sense as well. People, they're sure, they'll carry on with their global supply chains, but they'll complement it with regional supply chains and local supply chains, and they're willing to take a higher cost as a result of that. So I think there's an adjacent here between the interest of business mm. and the interest of government and development. Rebecca, is it realistic, this, this model, we need to go to some questions, but just quickly, the, the idea of an African free trade area and... Absolutely. Yeah. I, I am envious. 
yeah. South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and this energy that you can feel in the continent, you know, coming from Latin America, we have promised ourselves to have a common market forever and we haven't done it. Yeah. So when I look about, I will look at Africa and, and the numbers that we have in terms of what it can bring in terms of growth and prosperity for Africa is enormous. Is it, it, so let me, let me just say one, one thing is it is going to take time, you know, and perseverance and these things are not from one day to the other. But what we see is uh, we are very optimistic, I have to say. And, and absolutely it's about regional supply chains too. And here, let, let me just say one, one thing, Faisal, here, here, going to your point too. You know, in a way we are going from what we called hyper-globalization to polyglobalization, where regionalism will play a very important role. And is the type of regionalism not to get away from the global market, but to be able to participate in the global market in a better way. Yeah. And it's true that it will require the discussion of the rules of the game also in trade. And here one example that I can give you is uh, the Treaty on Trims, yes? You know, the, the, uh, if you in your investment policy uh, include provisions to, to, uh, 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 to, to have value, more than value added than what the investor wants to buy, it's against streams. Yes. But this is what we need <laughs> to yeah. be able to go up in the ladder. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Indonesia is a good example with yeah. the nickel. Yes. And, and the provision that you, that you took. But you were taken to court <laughs> in the WTO. So in a way, we need to put this on the balance. Well, so because, because if not, you know, developing countries will have a real problem in being able to have industrial policy and development, and the divergence will grow instead of... Uh, uh, right, I'm, fi I'm five minutes, so I'm eating into the question time. I want some questions on climate change. Uh, and why don't you answer that point? And just, will the West do this? Will, would the West, as far as you can see, change the rules of the global trade game to accommodate this fundamental engine of development? Well, I, uh, we should and we must, and I think uh, Minister Patel is making some great points. And, and uh, I also think, you know, the development opportunities for uh, less developed countries than South Africa in, on the African continent is immense. If we could invest in value chains in other countries getting into the regional trade, uh, that is, it's, it, you know, it's, they're, they're, it's such a lost opportunity, for example, when we see that African, country, uh, African countries are importing foodstuffs worth 75 billion US dollars a year. Mm. I mean, we could invest in value chains in the agricultural sector uh, in, uh, within Africa and get regional trade up and running to become uh, the African breadbasket, but, but, but the world's breadbasket. And one more example, um, you know, the, the, the events after the pand uh, or what pandemic taught us about uh, the distribution of vaccines. Now we are investing in mRNA uh, uh, a technology in South Africa, for example, uh, connecting the dots. Um, on the African continent, getting medical supplies, production of vaccines, etc., to the African continent. Of course, uh, why should uh, why should the African continent be reliant on imports of vaccine and and having to wait for vaccines uh, when we can invest in that production on the African continent? Well, that's I mean we're in danger of being quite optimistic here. So this is um, this is taking an unexpected turn. Let's take some questions. I mean we haven't addressed <laughs> climate change yet. So I'm keen on some questions, but we've got a range of experience I can just see with my eyes here of, of tangible examples of some of these quite kind of high weather systems of the global economy. You know, give us your own experiences, put some questions to the panel. Do I see any hands? There's a hand here, fantastic. You just identify yourself. We were talking about, uh, my name is Roshani and I run a microfinance program in Pakistan. We were talking about inequality of trade and growth among countries. But within countries, there's a lot of inequality. And that's really one of the big questions. Is trade or is economic development really delivering to all? So I'd like a response from uh, any of the panelists sure. on this. Who wants to take that? 
Rebecca? Well, if we continue to be commodity dependent, no. <laughs> because you cannot generate yeah. the, the employment and the opportunities that the rest of the population needs. And that's why this conversation is so important. Because we have to drive inclusive development within the countries. If you are concentrating in only a few products that you sell, and only on the extractive economy, so you won't be able to get the inclusive growth that you need. Now, there are many other things that have to be done. Development is a complex thing. <laughs> to be inclusive, you need education and you need health and you have to invest in people, yes? You have to create the capacities. Uh, you have to be able to give the opportunities to the small businesses and to women, yes, in terms of their agency in society. So there are a lot of things that have to be done in development. But maybe what I will say you need the most is to have a long-term view, yes? If you want quick fixes, we won't get anywhere. <laughs> yes? You know, I say many times that they, when you have a complex problem, only complexity can save you. <laughs> if you are reductionist, if you think that one, you, there is a, one bullet or one, you know, one solution, you, you, you won't be able to get it. You have to persevere. You have to have the, 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 the long term. And you have to have society. It has to be a project of society. And you can do that only uh, with inclusive uh, policies and dialogue. Um, Minister Patel, well, I'll put that to you. And I'll add a little bit of my own shine to it, which is obviously you have the normal development process, which can be redistributed within a country. But then you also have technology now going into sort of growing exponentially with all the AI being advertised around Davos, which is an even bigger factor, which may be redistributive <laughs> between people with high education and people with no education. What, is that causing you challenges within your country? Uh, yes, it is, but it's also an enormous opportunity. And, then, and I, I would respond to the Pakistan question. Uh, first, I, I, I like uh, Rebecca's uh, response. I'd say there are three issues within a country, and then there's the technology challenge. The first one for us has been the demographics. In, in South Africa's case, it's been more exaggerated, given our own history, that black South Africans have been excluded from economic participation. But we found also when you stretch the demographic lens, women, uh, youth-owned businesses, and it's trying to find a commercially sustainable way in which you can in, uh, bring greater inclusion. The second part is um, special, that um, uh, you, you have all over the world the, the challenge of where growth takes place. In our case, it takes place around major mining deposits and it takes place in the, the big urban areas. And so it, um, it encourages you know, enormous um, urbanization rates with, with uh, real challenges in managing it. And so it's how to find, because it's easier to create a job in an urban area, it's, it's less expensive. How do you manage all of that um, carefully? And then the third gap is between large and small, how to bring smaller players into markets. And the technology area is particularly challenging because in online platforms, in uh, the big tech markets, size counts even more than in traditional markets. And so how do you uh, ensure that smaller players, you create an ecosystem? And I must say we've had some incredibly interesting partnerships with the private sector. Mm -hmm. And if I can do a, you know, a, a shout out just on one example um, uh, where businesses as part of the arrangements in our legal system when they acquire another firm. Uh, there's normally a public interest uh, test that's applied to it. Mm -hmm. And they've created these um, supplier development funds to bring smaller players into the ecosystems. Walmart did that. They came to us subsequently and they said uh, they did it because they were required to do it. They now like it so much that they want to take that model to other parts of the world where Walmart is, is present. And companies like PepsiCo and uh, Coca-Cola uh, and Heineken have helped now to encourage a much greater employee share ownership in firms in South Africa as part of our empowerment scheme. So there's lots that can be done with the right will, with the right partnership, uh, we need not see development as uh, a challenge that should depress us. And you asked the question, you, you said, 
end of development. I was happy that uh, the WEF team had put a question mark rather than an exclamation mark. Um, and, and I think it's, it's this um, constant um, recognizing that while there are a lot of benefits from the way in which um, technology and economies work, it does need uh, active measures, mm. measures in partnership, measures by the public sector to ensure that we have inclusive outcomes. Mm. Let's, let's take a question down here. So that, that, was my, that was the question I wanted to ask. Is this the end of development from what you've said? This is not. Maybe it's, it's a different type, of, <laughs> different type of development, but this is yeah. not the end of development. Right. Okay, that's fair enough. Occasionally, it's the job of a headline to provoke, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> according to some journalists that I once met. Um, and the, let's have some more questions. Don't be shy. We've got a great audience here. I'm going to start picking on people in a minute. There we go. Yes. <laughs> uh, at the very beginning, you said that it was the big economies that were growing really well, but it seems like China is maybe not doing so well. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then simultaneously, the Gulf seems to be just exploding, which is maybe in, like in a good economic way in, in a number of countries. So that seems maybe like a part that you said was left behind, but actually it's growing incredibly quickly. So we'd love to understand that a little better. Yeah. Uh I said that they are growing better. <laughs> they are not growing like they used to grow. But I think that with the size that China has today, it will be very difficult to get back to where they were. You know, they are a big economy now. And so we have to expect that the rates of growth of China, it's very difficult that we'll get back to the two digits that we had in the past. But they are growing more than the rest. Uh, that, you know, so I was making a relative argument that uh, we are in a world of slower growth than we had before, but within that world, the big economies are doing better than the rest of the developing countries and doing also better than the developed world. They are, I think that the, the eight uh, big emerging economies will grow uh, more or less 4.2% uh, during this year. That's more or less the projection, yes? That is much more than the 1.2% that probably the rich countries will grow. But, but I guess is, is China offering a different development model? I mean, the, West, the, the Western World Bank, IMF kind of structures, there's an alternative pathway now, is there, is there not? A contrasting one. I think that in general, I, I would say that the rise of the global south, what meant is that there is no one size fits all, mm. that there is no one model of development, yeah. that we have to deal with the possibilities and the different opportunities that the countries have, and uh, there is no one model, you know, this idea that the south has to graduate to become the North. Yeah, no, no, okay. It's over. Yeah. Yes. Well, maybe that's you what know. the end of development means. Maybe that's what it means. It can mean what it wants you to mean. Um, um, we, I'm going to do a wrap-up question in a moment, but I just, sorry, obviously, with the climate change agenda, we've seen interesting negotiations, you know, the idea of a loss and uh, damage fund, which I kind of thought, I didn't imagine it would be agreed, has, has been agreed, albeit at a modest level. Um, let's discuss that. I mean, I mean you, you were in favour of that, weren't you? And where do you think that that, that will go? Um, and what was your response to, to, to that? Well, it's super, super exciting. Uh, it, uh, it came into place and, you know, got capital on board much quicker than we hoped uh, hope to this uh, in, in Dubai. So uh, that was one of the great outcomes from Dubai. Uh, but of course, uh, and, and, and um, you put money in, no put, put we, money we did, yeah. and many other countries did. And uh, there is a way we'd need lots more funding. But the fact that it's up and running with capital is, is, is great. And the World Bank is setting it up. It will be functioning within a few months, we hope. Yeah. Um, uh, the good thing about loss and damage is that it's, it's focusing also on not only the mitigation agenda, but also the adaptation agenda, because we need to invest in, you know, preparing for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for climate change as well. So uh, that's a, a positive outcome. But it's, I mean, it's, it's not enough. Yeah. Um, but there, there is this sort of fair transition point that the BRICS have led on, the idea that 
you know, hang on a moment, hang on a moment. Don't expect us not to develop in certain ways that, that are energy intensive. Obviously, we'll do it in a clean way, but we are doesn't really apply to South Africa. But you know, we are going to connect 800 million people across the globe to electricity. That is going to happen. I mean, do you feel those issues of, of, of a fair, just climate transition have been fully addressed in the current negotiations? Uh, if I use the <laughs> metaphor of a glass half full or half empty, yeah. the good news is there's water in this glass. Yeah. The bad news is there's still a lot of um, space here. So the size of the challenge and the size of the resources being put on the table don't match each other. Yeah. We need a lot more. Think about the African challenge. Just if I, if I look at the African continent, uh, we, we, we will be having large numbers of people going into cities, moving away from rural areas, and we need the opportunity to provide electricity, water, housing, all of that. We can do it in a green way, or we can try to do it in the traditional way. Mm. We want to do it in the green way, but it will be hugely costly. And so we'll need some pragmatic space to be able to combine these. The more resources on the table, the greener, the faster the green growth path can take place. That for me is really the, the, so the most significant thing uh, in, uh, in this equation. OK, well, it's been, been a really quite positive session, but I want to end on a really positive note, which is just, like, <laughs> give us very briefly some, some best practice. We've talked about the end of development, and then we agree it hasn't ended, but maybe it's evolving. But in this phase, you know, I, I am shocked. I mean, I consider myself still to be relatively young. I know that people will say that that's nonsense. But I can't believe even in my career as an economics journalist, or when I started studying economics at university and development, the progress of a country like Bangladesh has been absolutely extraordinary. And I, you know, I didn't even notice the time that it overtook, uh, there's some debate about this, India and GDP per capita, but that would have been absurd even from when I started studying economics, which was in 1995, uh, and it's happened. And I think people see that as a success of development. Give us some, give us some um, best practice in development that you have seen. You can't say South Africa. <laughs> I can't say South Africa. I won't even say the African continent. Let me, let me take Indonesia as an example. <laughs> So Indonesia started off, it's got enormous deposits of nickel yeah. and it sold the raw nickel to the world yeah. and it remained underdeveloped. It then took a decision that there's an opportunity to process that nickel. It took some tough decisions. It was taken to the World Trade Organization by um, uh, developed countries. But what it was able to do is transform a $3 billion export industry to a $30 billion stainless steel industry, creating well-paid jobs, attracting capital, diversifying the economy, creating more complexity in industrial development. All of the good things that industrial strategists and policymakers seek to do, they had to take a tough decision in the face of resistance from those who historically benefited from simply Indonesia's position as the export of great, a great example. This is why we have these panels. Alex, maybe a private sector example, but whatever you I mean, want. I think India is a real dark horse. We talk a lot about China, but look at India. Now, more than 90% of the population of India have digital identities. The average in Europe is just over 30%. Yeah. You know, the, look at the 20 years ago, over 90% of the graduates of the leading technology schools in India actually emigrated to the US or, or Europe. Now, less than 10% do. I think India is so well positioned to be an engine of economic growth for the world. And I think that that's a great example of how technology is going to be a game changer uh, for not just for companies, but also for economies and development. Great example. Rebecca? Vietnam. OK. Vietnam is a great example. And nobody thought that Vietnam will develop and div diversify uh, uh, so, so quickly. And it's a middle-sized country. And so that's why it's important also to bring it to the to the floor because they have been able to take the best and you know change the policy as they go along because there is no one policy that will be eternal <laughs> you need to adapt and they have been able to adapt to the new conditions with a, in a very flexible uh, manner last word um. costa rica <laughs> <laughs> There are, there are many good examples. Yeah. Um, can That's I? The best one example. Okay, but you know, then I'm going to do a nitty gritty one. Okay. And not one of the big, huge, large scale, because uh, we, we need to bring everyone on board, right? I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna, to uh, give you one example from Malawi, where we invested in the dairy sector. 
um, um, where where um, local companies were able to take uh, big shares of, of um, production uh, uh, instead of importing dairy. They were able to take off milk from small-scale farmers, 10,000 small-scale farmers in Malawi, uh, getting them that extra added value, giving them, you know, uh, um, uh, income for uh, feeding their children, sending the children to school, etc., etc., while getting those long value chains from the small-scale farmer to the local markets and the cities in Malawi working. And so that's bottom-up development, and it really works. But we need to make sure that the international trade system allows that kind of solution. Well, I just think that's a brilliant way to end a session in the sense that you've just been given a kind of tour of the world of positive best practice. Um, and from my perspective, with the title, with the caveat that it was maybe meant to provoke, it clearly isn't the end of development. Maybe it's the end of a phase of development that we've gotten used to. As I think Rebecca stole my line, which I was like, I'm going to, this is the way I'm going to end this session, but she got to it first. It's the start of development, one might argue. Um, and so thank you online for joining us and thank you for a great audience and a brilliant panel. Um, I'd say probably the best panel at Davos, but uh, <laughs> thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.